ready to do the job. This County Council report shows that Serco received 221 payroll inquiries in January this year. Whilst that's less than half the 530 it received in August 2016, some of those queries have yet to be resolved. And it appears that Serco still hasn't managed to produce employee pay statements for the year 2015-16. Serco is still failing to hit some of its targets. Although the overall situation appears to have improved, the council admits that this is partly because they've changed the way that success is measured. Speaking to BBC Look North last September, Serco denied that the company was out of its depth. No, we, I mean, we do contracts bigger than this elsewhere and do them really well, so I don't think the size is an issue at all. We can do it and we're absolutely committed to delivering this contract and delivering quality services. Meanwhile, Monks Abbey Primary School is one of 13 in the county that have decided to end their contract with Serco. And unless the problems can be resolved, some of the other 196 schools who use the company may decide to follow their lead. Jake Zuckerman, BBC Look North, Lincoln. Now I'll be asking for your experiences of Serco in just a moment, but this afternoon I spoke to Abby Tierney, who's a director at Serco, and asked her why the company is still failing to meet some of their targets 18 months after taking over the contract. We have seen significant improvement. The report that's gone to the council has shown that. And it's interesting because I was asked about the 221 payroll queries to remember that actually a lot of those are just in queries. They're not all errors. So we're, we're now delivering a good service. Yeah, that, that said, the, the council admit this is partly because of the way that the, they've changed the way that success is measured. Now, what about customer services centre? A quarter of customers said that waiting times are unacceptable or completely unacceptable. That's not good, is it? It, we've had um, a big implementation of an IT system, Mosaic, over the last few months, which has required a lot of training to ensure that the staff were all able to do that. We have seen our waiting times increase, but we're back on track to but bring you're going those in the down wrong, again. But you're going in the wrong direction. 95% of customers said they were happy with wait times last summer, and now you've got these figures. I think that is because of the um, IT system that we've implemented. Now that is implemented, we'll see those improve again. We're in this position now where schools are opting out of the contract and looking after their own payroll. Are, are you actually up to the job? Be honest with us. Uh, um, for schools, absolutely. For the th we have had 13 that have chosen to go um, with their own a different payroll provider. We've also had 12 that have decided to rescind their notice and stay with us because they've, the, they've seen the improvements. So we still run the payroll for the majority of schools in Lincolnshire. Today, Monks Abbey Primary School says a member of staff was almost paid 1.5 million last month before the error was spotted by the school. I mean, this is basic Janet and John stuff that you're not getting right. Yeah. We would have spotted the error as well. We have exception reports that would have picked up anything that was significantly higher than the previous so how did it get as far as how that. did it get as far as the school then? There are always, and when you're running a complex payroll of 16,500, there will always be a small number of errors, but the internal controls you've put in place ensure they spot, and they do include the school checking payroll. Managers check their payrolls. Are, are you fit for this contract? Absolutely, we're committed. We'll be there till at least 2020. Beyond saying either. No, I am starting to have the to do. But to this director out in terms of Serco, I think they've been good for the council, uh, maybe work at a school or somewhere else that has been affected by Serco. If you want to be in touch, the email address is there. Look north, all one word, at bbc.co.uk. The text number is 81333. Again, start the text with the word look north or follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Levy. Tweet now. Uh, the subject of Serco, not the first time we've talked about it. Uh, will it be the last? Uh, your thoughts will have some before seven o'clock. The trust which runs Burley House in Stamford has been fined more than a quarter of a million pounds after a butler was crushed to death in a luggage lift. Arthur Meller died in July 2014 from head injuries sustained during the incident. The Burley House Preservation Trust had already pleaded guilty to a breach of health and safety before today's sentencing at Peterborough Crown Court. Well, our reporter Caroline Bilton has been following the story and she's here in the studio with us now. What happened to Mr Meller? Well, this is a tragic story of the death of 47 year old Arthur Meller who worked as a butler as you say in one of the most iconic stately homes in the country Burley House in Lincolnshire of course 
The house had a lift that used to take uh, guests' bags up to the second floor uh, in the private wing of the house. But on July the 12th, 2014, one of the bags uh, got jammed and the lift stopped. Uh, Arthur, who'd worked as a butler for nine years at the house, tried to free that jammed bag, but in doing so, the lift fell onto him and he became trapped between the lift cage and the banister of the stairwell that held that lift. When paramedics arrived, his head had turned blue and there were no signs of life. Now, the court heard today, Peter, that there were no safety measures in place uh, and the lift hadn't been inspected by a competent lift engineer since it was installed in the late 1950s. Today, the charity that runs the home was fined £266,000. They were ordered to pay costs of just under £17,000. And in the last hour, we have spoken to Mr Mellor's civil partner, Gerwin Costello, and he's told us that he appreciates the fact that the Trust have accepted they were at fault. It's so good and, you know, brave of them to accept their fault. Um, but I'm, I really appreciate it that they admitted their fault, actually. So I think there's no um, amount of money that will replace um, Arthur anyway's life. And it, it will not bring Arthur back anyway to life. Um, he was my life. Um, he was my inspiration. It's, um, it's really difficult, you know. And I don't know if um, things will be the same without him. And what does the trust that runs Burley had to say? Well, the Burley House Preservation Trust have issued a statement this evening. In it, they say health and safety matters have always been paramount at Burley. What happened to Arthur was a dreadful and tragic accident. And they go on to say, we miss him and our thoughts are with Gerwin and Arthur's family. Now, Peter Carroll Court heard how the Burley estate has assets of £62 million. Now, under the sentencing guidelines, they could have been fined in excess of over half a million pounds but the judge did take into account the fact that they accepted responsibility and pleaded guilty. Today Judge Sean Enright said I recognise in particular the impact of this incident on Mr Castello and also the family. I would not want anyone to go away from this hearing under the impression of the fine that I impose as the value that society is imposing on the life of this man. It is not. Uh, the Trust have 28 days to pay this fine. Caroline, thank you. The actor Colin McFarlane wants all streetlights in Lincolnshire to be upgraded to use LED bulbs that use less energy. He thinks that will mean that the lights can stay on all night across the county. Councillors have been turning off thousands of lights to save money and say it's not cost effective to change every bulb. Mr McFarlane disagrees. If I was councillor for the day, I'd say to my team, why don't you go to Nottingham County Council where they've got the lights on and they're saving money and they're helping the environment. Why don't you go there and have a look at what they're doing and see if there's another way. Um, Herefordshire, as I said, are doing the same thing. York Council are doing the same thing. So it doesn't have to be this way. And the time is 20 minutes to 7 uh, this uh, Monday night here on BBC One. Thank you for your company. And uh, still ahead on the programme. There's a standing ovation for the world premiere of The Hypocrite at Hull Truck Theatre. And the online campaign to get a Red Arrows Lego set moves a step closer to reality. As always, keep the photos coming in and uh, let's show them uh, on the uh, telly halfway through the programme. Tonight's is the Humber Estuary and this was sent in by Julie Walters, oh, who nice. sent it along with two soups. Uh, I bet you've heard that before, <laughs> Julie Walters, haven't you? Uh, thank you very much yeah. indeed for that. And uh, actually, talking to celebrities, one male mm. celebrity, a popular male celebrity, is celebrating his birthday today. Peter Andre, happy birthday. Oh, oh really? Oh, really? I'm sure, well, I'm sure the card's in the post, isn't it, Peter? Yeah, happy thank birthday. Have a good day. Yeah. Yeah, Are you depressed? Much. Well, I'd be depressed if I had a bus pass, Peter. Let's have a look. Shall we have a look I at the headlines? Got, or whatever. <laughs> I haven't got a bus pass. Uh, he has. Let's have a look at the headline then. Uh, it looks as though it's going to remain uh, changeable, but we have a warning in place. Uh, for fairly widespread ice which will affect untreated surfaces towards the end of the night. Uh, tomorrow's, uh, well, it's uh, bright in the morning with some sunshine. I think by the end of the afternoon, 
We'll see showers heading in from the west, and it's quite showery tomorrow evening and tomorrow night. Low pressure in charge, and it's quite uh, cold air wrapped up with uh, this system. Uh, so there'll be showers, even longer spells of rain. And this feature, perhaps uh, into Wednesday night, uh, Thursday, might produce a little bit of uh, snow over the tops of the walls for a short time, but it's not expected to cause too many problems. Now, it's been chucking it down in uh, Hull and Grimsby in the last couple of hours. That uh, line of heavy showers is currently moving into the uh, North Sea. So I think after quite an unsettled start to this evening with those showers uh, and we'll see one or two showers moving in from the west through the course of the night. Basically many of us become dry with some decent clear spells. Watch out for ice on untreated surfaces and we'll see lowest temperatures rurally around uh, freezing point. So the sun rises at uh, 5 to 70 next high water time. Oh there we are, Hull Victoria Dock at 7.27 in the morning. So one or two showers are possible. Otherwise, it's a generally fine morning, dry and bright with some sunshine, but cloud will increase uh, through the afternoon, particularly later on, bringing those showers in from the uh, west, certainly late afternoon and into tomorrow evening. Top temperatures feeling uh, fairly cold with a brisk west or southwest wind. Temperatures around 7 Celsius, that's 45 Fahrenheit. Wednesday's not looking too bad, but the risk of some rain, possibly a little wet snow over the top of the walls. Wednesday night, Peter. That's the forecast. Well, uh, joking about, very happy uh, 50th to you. Have a, uh, have a good day. <laughs> Don't be depressed. The, te the teachers love you. Right, uh, see, oh. see you tomorrow. The line's gone dead again. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it has. I'm sure it has. <laughs> happy birthday. Now, the uh, fastest selling show in the history of Hull Truck Theatre has had its world premiere this weekend. Tickets for The Hypocrite have proved so sought after that the theatre fitted extra seats for the shows. The play is being staged with the Royal Shakespeare Company, which moved its actors, props and technicians lock, stock and barrel to Hull. Our culture correspondent, Amri Tusker, has been behind the scenes with the production. War is inevitable now. It's a comedy about Hull by a writer from Hull. So where else to stage Hull Truck and the Royal Shakespeare Company's new play? The English Civil War starts now. Who will make the first advance? Since January, the cast of The Hypocrite have been rehearsing in a disused church on the Thornton estate, including the stars Caroline Quentin and Mark Addy. The play's frantic, funny, and there's a lot of us in it. And for those of us that come from a time when it's too expensive to have a lot of people on stage, you're normally involved with five-handers and things, it's really exciting to be on stage with that many folk. Oh, wow. The play is by Holborn writer Richard Bean, who spent more than two years researching Sir John Hotham, oh, Sir John. the man who shut Hull Sir city gates on the King in 1642 and sparked the start of the Civil War. When I started reading all these original papers, it's like reading a Fado farce, a French farce. That final thing where the governor of the town is running on his own chaste. You know, I mean, I'm not going to say Benny Hill. Well, I was thinking... Yeah, you are. Th I could see it in your eyes you were thinking Benny Hill. It took the technical team a whole week to build the set, ready for the show. It's now two days till opening night and everyone's heading through to the stage for technical rehearsals. It's the last chance for everyone in the team to practice and practice the trickiest bits of the play until they're perfect. As the lead, Mark Addy is in most of this three-hour show, so rehearsals have been gruelling. With Hull being the City of Culture 2017, to be involved as one of the kind of opening, uh, the big opening shows of, of, of that year is terrific. I do sometimes think, ah, am I too old for this? But, uh, but no, we, we're getting there and I, I just think it's a gift of a, of a show. Opening weekend and the theatre's installed benches so it can offer more tickets to this sold-out show. And featuring fights and incredible illusions, it got a standing ovation. I'm more interested in whether they're following the story and, uh, you know, laughing, whether they stand at the end is irrelevant to, to me. Uh, I'm lying, of course, I love it, yeah. Of course, they're standing, right! Big stars in a big cast for the biggest theatrical moment of 2017 so far. Anne-Marie Tasker, BBC Look North, Hull. That is fantastic, isn't it? Uh, a real achievement for Hull. Big fan of Caroline Quinton as well. And you can see more about the uh, journey of the RSC to uh, Hull. Uh, don't miss this. It's on tonight's uh, Inside Out at 7.30 in uh, three quarters of an hour's time here on uh, BBC One Inside Out. Don't miss that.
Now, Hull shoppers are getting a glimpse tonight of a rather unusual film that is part of the city of Kochip, and it's being previewed in a supermarket car park. Flood is described as an epic adventure about the end of our world. There'll be more information about Flood tomorrow when details of the next six months of the City of Culture programme is announced. But tonight, Katie Austin has gone along to see what the film is all about. What's going on there, Katie, then? Well, yes, Peter, I am in fact in the car park of Asda on Hessel Road in Hull and something rather unusual is parked up in the car park here. It's a silver caravan which has actually been transformed into a cinema and if we just go up the steps we can see what it's like inside. Uh, there are a few red chairs and people have been coming in here, putting on those headphones and listening to a five-minute film which is the first part of Flood, a multimedia, months-long uh, adventure tale and this is what they thought of it. Oh, it was interesting, beautifully filmed, yeah. uh, and now very curious just to follow on the story through it. And now I understand it's in four parts, mm. and the next part is in April. Mm. We shall go and watch the second part and follow it through the year. Now, the film has been put together by a Yorkshire-based theatre company called Slung Low, and I'm pleased to say the director joins me now, Alan Lane. Alan, tell us a bit about this film that you put together, then. What can people expect? Uh, it's the prologue to the whole year adventure, so it has the amount of intrigue that you'd want, and it's the story of two fishermen who go out to sea and find something they're not expecting at the bottom of the ocean. Cool, so no spoilers, but what kind of atmosphere is it? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's, it's beguiling, the first part. It's definitely a mystery, and it leaves us on a, a cliffhanger. And uh, when filming it, you did go out on a boat, didn't you? We did on a brilliant boat out of uh, Whitby called The Chieftain, and we were sick as dogs. <laughs> was it worth it, though? Yeah, I'm very pleased with the film. It was just hard work. Great. And uh, Asda Car Park this evening, where next? A uh, um, uh, supermarket, uh, different supermarket every single day this week in Hull. Great. Now, thank you very much for that. Now, you can also see the film online. If you've got children, I would say it's got a recommended 12A guidance, so you might want to bear that in mind. And obviously tomorrow we'll find out what's happening for the rest of the next six months of the City of Culture. We look forward to that. Katie, uh, thank you very much indeed. Now, BBC Radio 2 was the latest national broadcaster to make Hull their home today, reflecting the City of Culture status. The Jeremy Vine Show was presented today by Paddy O'Connell from the Punch Hotel in the city centre. Plenty of Hull's big-name guests were on the show, including uh, Lord Prescott. And also, and it was uh, great to see uh, the bee lady, uh, Jean Bishop, as well. She was on. If you missed the show, been at work all day, the whole two hours of a network radio programme was all about Hull and of course you can find it on the iPlayer. Now Lincoln City moved closer to a day out at Wembley this time in the FA Trophy. The National League leaders have reached the semi-final of the competition. Our sports reporter Simon Clark is here so uh, should the Imps fans be booking hotel rooms for May? Peter, it seems that every week I'm here with you talking about Lincoln City making history and they're at it again. They've become the first team to reach the semi-finals of the FA Trophy and the quarter-finals of the FA Cup in the same year. The Imps have been drawn against York City in the trophy. Meanwhile, the winner of the replay between Dulwich Hamlet and Macclesfield Town will take on Tramia Rovers in the other semi-final. The ties will be played over two legs in March with the winner heading to Wembley for the final in May. If you'd have said this time last year we'd be rearranging a, a trophy semi-final because an FA Cup quarter-final is getting in the way, I think we'd have, uh, well, we'd been locked up, wouldn't we? But uh, no, it's fantastic news for everybody and it's uh, very exciting times. Lincoln is still on course for promotion, as are Scunthorpe United, who had to come from behind to gain a draw at Bristol Rovers in their assault on League One. This equaliser, an own goal from Tom Lockyer, was enough to keep the iron second on goal difference. Today, the ground staff worked tirelessly to make sure Glanford Park was playable for tomorrow's game. United meet Wimbledon, looking for a first win in five matches after two defeats and three draws. We're not worried. We are, as I said, we're, we're just going to focus on ourselves. If we keep winning games, then it, it, was, it won't matter about what's behind us. So um, we'll, uh, we'll hopefully get back to winning ways tomorrow and then um, another big game on Saturday. We're frustrated at the moment that we haven't picked up the, the wins that we would hope to do. Um, but um, we've stayed competitive um, and uh, we've picked up points along the way. Hull City look to have climbed out of the Premier League relegation zone after taking the lead against Burnley. But they couldn't match the Imps a week earlier, conceding a late equaliser. It's clear the team now believe, the, the our fans believe as well. 
and our fight we need to continue in our fight in our work um, i see the, the our team with progress and it's important for us believe always Grimsby Town succumbed 1-0 at Morecambe in League 2, while North Ferriby United lifted themselves off the foot of the National League with victory at Geisley. Well, on to boxing and Olympic gold medalist Luke Campbell moved a step nearer his goal of a world title bout. He was in devastating form at the Hull Arena to beat Mexican Jario Lopez. Campbell was thrilled by the reception of his home crowd as his team seeks a world title fight for him later in the year. The thing is for me is I'm out the country a lot, so I don't get to see a lot of people because I'm out with, I'm, I'm in training camp all the time and like trying to be the best I can be. So it's nice for me then to come back to Hull and see everybody and put a show on for everyone. And news from uh, Rugby League this afternoon has seen Hull FC Joe Scott Taylor and Liam Watts charged with misconduct after Thursday's game with Catalan Dragons. So as you can see, Peter, quite a lot going on. It certainly is, uh, Simon, thank you. And uh, you can see some highlights from that uh, Hull FC game on the Super League show tonight. It's on BBC One at 11.30 and that is straight after match of the day. The famous Red Arrows could be immortalised in Lego. A campaign to get a model of the Lincolnshire-based display team made in the famous toy bricks has won enough votes to be considered for production. Amanda White has more. They're well known across the world and loved across our nation. But the Lincolnshire-based Red Arrows could be about to take a step into superstardom. Lego is no longer a toy confined to the bedroom carpet. It boasts two Hollywood blockbusters, countless video games, and every hour more than two million plastic blocks are made to satisfy worldwide demand. And soon this iconic red aircraft could be amongst it all. We launched the model just over five and a half weeks ago and it's attracted over 10,000 votes, which is what's required. And yeah, it's really good, really promising uh, and really excited. And now it's up to Lego bosses to make a decision on Marcus's idea. So the next review board is in May uh, and then they'll look at all the different um, aspects of the model. So the playability, whether children like it, how easy or hard, how hard it is to uh, make, uh, the cost of the model, the number of bricks. The people who live in the villages surrounding the home of the Red Arrows here at Scampton are lucky enough to see the real thing most days, practising in the skies above, but how would they feel about having their very own little red at home to build and play with? I think it's a really good idea. I think Lego is such a good thing for adults and children alike, so yeah, it'd be really good. I think it would be good as long as it's easy and I can do it, because uh, my history with Lego is not a good one. It would give the red arrows a lot more publicity and uh, it'd be fun, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, great idea. Would you buy one? Uh, Oh, I, I, I live and see them every day, so I don't think I would, really. <laughs> but uh, I think it would make a good thing for um, visitors to buy, perhaps. Lego has a policy of not making military toys, but it's hoped the Red Arrows will be seen as a UK ambassador that inspires young people. Amanda White, BBC Look North. Amanda White and Lego, what could possibly go wrong? Now, let's have a reminder of the main national and regional headlines. There's chaos at the Oscars as La La Land is wrongly named Best Picture before the mistake is corrected and Moonlight gets the award. More payment problems in Lincolnshire. The firm in charge, Serco, almost pays a school employee £1.5 million in error. And tomorrow's weather, a cold and windy day with sunny spells at first, but with showers coming in from the west later on. Top temperature 7 Celsius, 7 is 45 Fahrenheit. Now, on the subject of uh, Serco and payment problems in Lincolnshire, thank you for all the emails, texts and tweets. Anthony says, another example of privatisation not being successful. Cutting costs only results in poorer performance. It is false economy. Trevor says, Serco get unfairly slammed at every opportunity. Look on the internet and see all the other excellent work they do incredibly well. I have worked for Serco for 22 years and never had any reason to complain. Thank you, Trevor. Obviously wants a pay rise. Uh, Vincent from Briggs says, I was listening with amazement. How can Serco say a small number of errors is expected? And uh, Martin says, uh, you can be sure that Serco bosses and managers don't get their 
own pay wrong. And just finally, this is from Mark. He says that this is what happens when you outsource to the lowest bidder. What a shambles. A story we've done in the past. Who knows whether we'll be uh, doing it again. Thank you for those. Thank you for watching. More at half past ten. Join me then for the second look north. If not, I'll see you tomorrow. Half past six.